Okay, welcome to this video. Today we're going to be covering elements, compounds, and mixtures. And basically what this is, is a summary of sections 3.3 and 3.4. So let's go ahead and give some definitions. Uh, what we're doing here basically is uh, categorizing matter. And the important thing here is to try to figure out, you know, how matter is categorized and what types of matter make up other types of matter. If you read the book, section 3.3, then 3.4, um, you know, I, I think it would be a good idea to first read 3.4 first, then go back to 3.3. It seems like 3.3 on mixtures, once you know what elements and compounds are, which is talked about in section 3.4, then it's much easier to get an idea of what mixtures are. I don't know why the book did what they did. So I recommend you reading section 3.4 first, and then going back to section 3.3. So let's go ahead and give uh, some definitions. And we've already uh, talked about what matter is, right? You know, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Uh, but matter comes in many different forms. Basically, we said earlier, everything around us is matter, with a few exceptions. You know, things like light is not are not matter because they have no mass. Uh, light has no mass, and uh, you know, it's basically kind of an energy field. Uh, and we'll get in, more into light and the nature of light uh, in chapter five. So uh, I'm not going to leave it just at that, but we'll we'll come back to that. We can uh, classify matter then into two main categories, pure substances and mixtures. The big difference between pure substances and mixtures is that pure substances have a definite composition. In other words, they are always made of the same stuff in the same proportions and mixtures can be uh, mixed around they can be varied in their composition. So uh, let's take a look at pure substances. Pure substances can be subdivided into two other categories. So matter in general can be broken up into pure substances and mixtures. And both of those categories we can break down into further categories. Pure substances can be subdivided into two other categories, elements and compounds. and in the next slide after this, we'll see it visually. Uh, so don't worry about that right now and getting it all together, but just to let you know that's kind of where we're going. Um, pure substances, as I said earlier, is matter that has a definite composition. And I'll, and I'll give you an example in a little bit. Well, I'll give you an example now. Uh, water is always, well, you guys know that water is H2O. Right, that's the formula for water. I think that's one, the one chemical formula everybody knows. H2O is water. And what that means is that water molecules are made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And it always has to be two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. If you change that proportion, if you change whether it's hydrogen or oxygen, add another element in there, or if you get rid of a hydrogen or an oxygen, it's not water anymore. And it's always got to be twice as many hydrogens as oxygens. Or if you want to say it by mass, oxygens are heavier than hydrogens. It's got to be 89% by mass of oxygen and 11% hydrogen. So um, whichever way you say it, by mass or by you know number of atoms, it always has to have that same composition. Okay, so pure substances or substances for short have a definite composition, always the same. Here's the uh, chart that I was showing. So as you can see at the top, we have matter right here. This is matter. And matter can be broken up into pure substances. And we'll see in a little bit later on when you read section 3.3 that mixtures have varying compositions. So mixtures, you can vary the composition. For example, salt water is an example of a mixture. It's got salt in it, it's got water in it. Um, it is not a pure substance because there's more than two things in there. And the proportion that you can put the salt in the water in and still keep it to be salt water is can vary. You can have a lot of salt in it. You can have very little salt in it. It's still salt water. On the other hand, you can't put more hydrogen and, uh, in the water and still have it be water. It it's changes properties. It will behave differently. So um, pure substances are here on the left side, and those pure substances get broke down to elements and compounds. 
mixtures, as we'll see later on, get broken up into homogeneous mixtures, otherwise known as solutions. And sometimes you'll ref you'll hear me refer to solutions um, in general uh, because I'm so used to talking about it, and I forget that we're not going to cover solutions until like chapter 15. So I forget that we you haven't been through it, but solutions are basically these mixtures of substances, usually uh, substances um, that have been dissolved in water. We call those aqueous solutions. So salt water, as we were talking about earlier, is usually an aque uh, is a mixture. It's aqueous because it's dissolved in water, but it's got salt in there. Um, heterogeneous mixtures are uh, a little different. Uh, because heterogeneous mixtures are not as well mixed. It's a big difference. We'll come back to those in a little bit, but just to show you this. We'll see this slide in just a little bit also, and it's in your book also in section 3.4. Here are some examples of elements. And what is an element? An element is the simplest kind of substance. These elements cannot be broken down into simpler substances because they are made of only one kind of atom. So here I have examples of three different elements. On the left here, I have zinc. It's a metal. And we'll talk about what's a metal, what's a non-metal later on. But uh, every atom in this chunk right here is a zinc atom. They're all the same. Here's chlorine. And uh, this the element chlorine here. In this sample of chlorine, every atom in that sample is chlorine gas, or is chlorine. It happens to be a gas. This is iron, and though iron looks a lot like zinc, it has different properties. And every atom in this chunk right here is an iron atom. Okay, so um, these are examples of elements. And of course, there's a lot of elements. I mean, how do you know whether something is an element or not? Here's the easy way to do it. Look on the periodic table. Okay. The periodic table is, is a short term name uh, for the periodic table of the elements. And so if something is an element, it is on here. And so um, if you want to know if something is an element, look on the periodic table. If it's on there, like here, number 26 is iron. Number 30 is zinc. 17 is chlorine. And we have all these other elements uh, out there. Number one is hydrogen. The most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen. Number two is helium. And all these guys, these are all elements. So if you ever hear of any of these, they are the simplest kinds of substance. And when you have a sample of an element, it means that every atom in that sample is made up of the same kind of atom. Okay. Compounds, right? So pure substances are either elements or compounds. This is the second one. Compounds are substances made up of two or more elements. And because they're made up of two or more elements, they can be broken down into their component elements. Okay, so if we wanted to, we could decompose these guys. We'll see what decomposition is later on in uh, chemical uh, reactions uh, chapter. But if we wanted to, we can break these down into simpler uh, substances. And we can break them down all the way until we get elements out of them. So this first example here is of calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is actually made up of three elements. There's calcium, there's carbon, that's where you see the carbon in there, and there's also oxygen. The eight later on we will learn um, is, uh, tells you that there's oxygen in there. So calcium, carbon, and oxygen make up calcium carbonate. We put those together in specific uh, proportions one calcium for every one carbon for every three oxygens, uh, and that makes calcium carbonate. Sodium chloride is your typical table salt, and it is just made up of two elements, sodium and chlorine, and so therefore we call it sodium chloride. We will get into naming these guys um, just down the line in a few chapters. Water is also a compound because it's made up of hydrogen and oxygen, both hydrogen and oxygen, um, so it is a compound. Um, you know, just about everybody knows. And over here, I put on an example of a more complex compound. This one is Advil. And Advil is a compound, or actually, Advil is a brand name. The compound really is called ibuprofen. Most 
medicines have their what we call their generic name the name of the compound that that medicine is and then you know some companies will make it and call it one thing like advil another company will make it and call it um uh, motrin so motrin and advil are the same thing they're both ibuprofen and there's even one marketed toward uh um toward women uh when they're having their uh, menstrual cramps or monthly menstrual cramps uh called i think it was pamperin and pamperin is also just ibuprofen so you know they're, they're all the same substance ibuprofen is a compound made up of carbon hydrogen nitrogen and oxygen uh, but it is those atoms are structured in a certain way that they give a specific uh, effect they have a specific properties and that's what makes the medication ibuprofen okay but it is a compound some of these are really simple sodium chloride is made up of, so of sodium and chlorine water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen calcium carbonate is made up of three elements carbon calcium and oxygen and ibuprofen is made up of four it's carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen yeah it's made up of four um, elements right so um, some are even more complex um, so we're going to keep to the simple stuff luckily in this class but just to let you guys know that they're out there mixtures on the other hand are matter made up of two or more substances whether it be elements or compounds and the thing is that what makes them different mixtures different than pure substances is the fact that when you mix these things they don't chemically bond together when you make a compound the atoms inside that uh, compound bond together in a mixture they don't bond together they just kind of mix all right so things like milk milk's got a whole bunch of stuff it's got a whole bunch of compounds in it uh, and you can vary the amount and it doesn't change the fact that it's milk so there's stuff like lactose, which is a sugar. There's water in there. That's uh, basically, you know, what everything's dissolved in. There is protein, there is fat. And, you know, the fat actually shows you that it can be a mixture because you can vary the fat. I mean, there's non-fat milk, there's 1% milk, there's 2% milk, there's whole milk. And all the difference between all those different types of milk is how much fat is in there. Okay, so if you can vary the amounts uh, then it's a mixture. Orange juice also is a mixture. Um, you know, there's sugar in there. There's acid, uh, citric acid in there. There's a bunch of stuff in there. You can even vary how much pulp is in there. It still doesn't change the fact that it's orange juice, right? That's what makes it a mixture. Steel is also an example of a mixture. When we have metal mixtures, we have a special name for them. They're called alloys. And so if you've ever heard of a metal alloy, that is just a... Um, uh, a, a mixture of two or more uh, metals so steel's got iron in it but it's also got carbon uh, i think it's also got some nickel in there it's a mixture of of um, metals all right so once again here's our chart once again here's how we break it down uh matter is broken up into pure substances which have definite composition mixtures where the composition can vary and pure substances can break them up into elements, which are made up of one kind of atom, and compounds, which are made up of more than one kind of atom. Mixtures are more than uh, two, two or more substances uh, mixed together. And the difference between what we call a homogeneous mixture and a heterogeneous mixture is how well it's mixed and whether it stays mixed. I mean, think about it. Bottle of Coke. You don't let a bottle of Coke just sit there and it kind of separates on its own, right? Um, so that would be a homogeneous mixture. If it stays mixed, it's a homogeneous mixture. On the other hand, uh, there are mixtures that will kind of separate from each other. You know, you put some sand and water, mix it up really well, or oil and water, mix them up really well. They will eventually separate. Uh, the sand will drop to the bottom. And so we'll end up with, you know, sand at the bottom and water on top. And... I don't know if you've ever done it, but oil and water, if you mix them up, they will eventually separate and give you a layer of oil and water uh, eventually that could begin. And so those are examples of heterogeneous mixtures. Okay. So know those things, get them all kind of organized in your head, okay. how these all fit together. 
Um, we looked at the periodic table, and the periodic table um, has little boxes on it. Let me go ahead, before I start talking about chemical symbols, uh, I'll go back over here. The periodic table is made up of a whole bunch of boxes, and each box represents one element uh, at a time. This is kind of your basic periodic table, which gives you some basic information. Not all periodic tables give the same uh, piece of information. Let's take a look at this one and see what, you know, is all, always takes place and what uh, can change. So let's take a look at nitrogen here, as I'm pointing to. Nitrogen, there are four pieces of information in here about this element. Uh, first off, there's the name, nitrogen. It's right there. Not all periodic tables will give you the name, but most of them will. Uh, but you're, you need to kind of be able to, um, you know, uh, be able to know what element it is by looking at this chemical symbol. So that's what I want to talk about in just a little bit. But um, nitrogen, you know, they'll have its name. It'll have a chemical symbol. And if you look at all the, all the boxes on the periodic table, every element has either a one letter or two letter symbol. And um, the, when there is only a one letter symbol, it is a capital letter. And when it's a two letter symbol, like let's say chlorine over here, it is capital first letter, lowercase second letter. And that is done so that we won't get confused uh, between whether the two letters are two separate elements or <clears throat> one element with two letters. <coughs> so um, it's important to know that. And when you write your symbols, if you have a two letter ele uh, element symbol, the first letter should be capital. The second letter should be lowercase. Okay. Um, the other two pieces of information we'll look at more in chapter four, but there is usually a whole number, which is called the atomic number. And later on, we'll find that that is the number of protons uh, in an atom of an element. If you know what protons are already, then you know, now you know what the atomic number is. However, if you don't, we'll cover that in chapter four. And at the bottom, there is also a number with decimals in it. And that's what we call the atomic mass, which we'll also learn about in chapter four. Okay, so um, not all periodic tables have all this information on them. They can't, they generally tend to have this, but sometimes you can do another periodic table where they put other information in there. Uh, and, uh, you know, they might put boiling points or some type of property that has to do with the element. And since there's only a certain amount of space, they'll replace it with something else. So they might, instead of putting the name in it, give you the boiling point, not put nitrogen, but no Assume that you know that capital N is nitrogen. Okay. So going back to the slide then, some of the things I talked about, chemical symbols are one or two letter symbols that represent the element. The chemical symbols of the element always begin with a capital letter. If there is a second letter in the symbol, it is always a lowercase. And Chemical symbols are found on the periodic table of elements, along with such things as the element's name, atomic number, and atomic mass. Okay. Generally, you'll find those, but they may be replaced here or there, depending on the purpose of the periodic table. Okay, so um, it's going to be uh, important to be able to recognize these symbols because later on when we put together chemical formulas, we are going to use the chemical symbols to put together chemical formulas. Compounds have chemical formulas made up of the symbols of the elements that make them up. That's why water is H2O, because the chemical symbol for hydrogen is an H. The chemical symbol for oxygen is an O. So to show that those are the two elements in water, we put a capital H and a capital O in the formula. The two represents how many hydrogens there are relative to oxygens. Right? And we'll get more into that later on too. Right now, just know that the chemical symbols are one or two letter symbols that represent the element. Okay. All right. Uh, one last thing on chemical symbols, and that is that uh, some people, some of you guys, some people look at these symbols and they look at them and go, "These, some of these don't seem to make sense," because you know, 
carbon makes sense. The word carbon starts with a C, so you use a capital C for carbon, right? Um, fluorine makes sense because you, the word fluorine starts with an F, and therefore you use the letter F to make that. Um, even things like argon, well, argon starts with AR, so the symbol AR makes sense for argon. But there are others that don't seem to make sense. For example, sodium's symbol is capital N, lowercase a, Na. Na is a symbol for sodium, and I have it right here. <clears throat> the reason why they use Na is because these, wor these symbols don't come from the English words for the chemical uh, elements. They come from the Latin terms. So I don't know what carbon is in Latin, but I think I know in Spanish it's car car carbono, carbono, and it probably sounds a lot like since Spanish comes from Latin. Um, there's probably a the Latin term for carbon is probably some something that starts with a C, so it makes sense. Um, but you know, everybody in the world uses the periodic table, and when scientists decided. Uh, to adopt symbols for every element. They had to kind of make a decision. Well, what language shall we use to make the symbols from? I mean, uh, do we use the Chinese language and Chinese characters? Do we use the German language, which might have a little different, um, you know, word for iron? <clears throat> do we use English? Do we use Spanish? And I think so everybody wouldn't fight. Nobody uses Latin anymore. So they decided on Latin. Um, not, not exactly sure if that's the truth, but uh, they, they did decide to use Latin. So um, the reason why sodium symbol is Na is because in Latin, sodium is uh, called natrium. So Na, natrium is the first two letters uh, in, um, Na is the first two letters in natrium, therefore um, they use that for sodium. Okay. Same thing, potassium. Potassium is a capital K, and that's it. It's only one letter, but still, you know, if you look at potassium, shouldn't it be a P? Well, P is for phosphorus, um, but the Latin term for cal uh, for potassium is kalium. Iron is a very common element, and, uh, you know, you'd think, well, that one should be, uh, you know, easy. It should be IR, right? Actually, IR is iridium. Um, Fe is what's used for iron because in Latin, iron is ferrum and um, gold uh, is Au and that's because in Latin, gold is arum. So all these, and these are just four of many, uh, you know, tungsten is a W, why? Because in Latin, tungsten is wolfram with a W. So there are many other examples of symbols that don't look like they go, uh, they go with the English name of the element, and they don't. They go with the Latin name, okay? So just so you guys know, and you're just gonna have to get used to uh, the symbol that goes with every number. I mean, every element, sorry. Okay, uh, two laws at the end of the chapter. And I really don't want you guys to get too bogged down in these laws because we're going to be using these laws and not really knowing it later on down the line. And the reason I tell you that is because these laws are found in this chapter um, and we're really going to learn what they are and think of them as things that kind of led us to understand how compounds were put together. Way back in the day before there was a lot of experimentation uh, people could barely just kind of break down substances and count how many grams of each substance there was in a certain uh, compound. So they didn't have the technology to figure out, well, you know, how much of each element there is in terms of atoms and what they look like. So this is from before. Um, but there are two laws, one called the law of definite proportions and the other one called the law of multiple proportions that I'm just going to go ahead and talk about briefly here, just so you get an understanding of what they are. Later on, we're actually going to be putting them to practice. But like I said, we're going to do it without under uh, without understanding what they are, because once we start putting together chemical formulas, that is using these laws of definite proportions and law of multiple proportions 
Um, but we're going to be putting those things together in a different way, looking at different things to put them together. So this just kind of tells you how these things work. And actually turns out that we, the early researchers used these two laws in order to kind of understand how these compounds were put together and that there would be some chemical formulas that would kind of work. Um, I'll go ahead and show you examples as we go through here. So let's first look at the first law, the law of definite proportions. The law of definite proportions states here in the first bullet point, regardless of amount, a compound is always composed of the same elements in the same proportion. So if you have one compound, it's always made up of the same elements, whether it be two, three, four, five, or however many elements. And those elements are always going to be in the same proportion. Okay. So water is always going to be 89% oxygen by, by mass and 11% hydrogen by mass. All right. So it doesn't matter if I've got five grams of water or uh, five tons of water or, you know, the swimming pool of water. 89% of that water is always oxygen and 11% is hydrogen. Okay. And that's basically what the law of definite proportions is telling you. Calcium carbonate, which we saw an example of earlier, um, is made up of these three elements, calcium, carbon, and oxygen. And it is 40% mass calcium, 12% mass carbon, and 48% uh, mass oxygen. Okay, so um, those are the... Um, that's, that's what a lot of different proportions tells you, is that you have a compound that's made of the elements and uh, they always have to be the same proportion. It kind of goes with that whole idea of a pure substance having a definite composition. And the second law, this one's a little more complicated, but as we start putting together chemical formulas, you'll see kind of what that means. So, uh, this one's the law of multiple proportions and the, the way that the law is stated is a mouthful and it's a little confusing. So that's why I did an example. The law of multiple proportions says, and on this first bullet point right here, when different compounds are formed by a combination of the same elements, different masses of one element combined with the same relative mass of the other element in a ratio of small, I'm uh, sorry, of, of whole small numbers. Okay. And, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> Let me go ahead and try to explain it. Okay. Uh, let's say that you know that there are two elements of copper and chlorine, because there are. You can get one compound of copper and chlorine and then a second compound of copper and chlorine. They're different. They have different um, properties. Um, and so what the law of multiple proportions says is if you can get two compounds made up of the same elements, then if you go ahead and look at the ratio of one element to the other in the first compound and you compare it to the ratio of one element that same first element to the same second element in the second compound then those two ratios are going to be in a small whole number ratio so once now let's delve in deeper here okay so we've got a compound made up of copper and chlorine the first compound for every one gram of copper in this first compound there is 0.56 grams of chlorine. Okay, and so you could go ahead and get your compound, you know, and get enough of it so you end up with one gram of copper. Whenever you have one gram of copper, you'll end up with 0.56 grams of chlorine because remember that there's definite proportions in this compound. The, number, the, the proportion of chlorine to copper always has to be the same for compound one. So it doesn't matter if you've got, you know, 10 grams um, or 78 grams or 2,300 grams, um, for every one gram of copper, there's got to be 0.56 grams of chlorine. And that's just something that uh, people are going to you know, calculate or figure out or measure. They'll, they'll take the compound with copper and chlorine in it, break it down into copper and chlorine, and for every one gram of copper, there's 0.56 grams of chlorine. You can do the same to co compound two but it has a different proportion. It's a different compound. So it's going to have a different proportion of chlorine to copper. And this time, this example, the second compound, there is more chlorine than copper. And for every one gram of copper, there's 1.12 grams of chlorine. So going back to the definition, let's take a look at something. It says, um, 
You know, when different compounds are formed by the combination of the same elements, these are two different compounds formed by the combination of these same two elements. Different masses of one element combine with the same relative mass of the other element. So that same relative mass means for every gram of copper, we are comparing one gram of copper in the first compound to one gram of copper in the second compound. So we got the same grams of, compound, of copper. But there's going to be different masses of the chlorine. So as you can see, for every one gram of copper in the first compound, there's 0.56 grams of chlorine. For every same one gram of copper in the second compound, there's 1.12 grams of chlorine. Okay. And what the law of multiple proportions is basically saying is that if you compare these two numbers, these two numbers should be the same thing. If you compare these two numbers, they should give you a whole uh, a ratio of small whole numbers. And what we do is take our 1.12 grams and compare it to 0.56. And if I were to take the 1.12 grams of chlorine from the second compound, because it's a bigger number, divided by the 0.56 grams of chlorine in the first number, in the first compound, take one divided by the other, it gives me exactly 2.0. What that's telling me is there's twice as many grams of chlorine in the second compound as there are in the first compound relative to the amount of copper, right? So there's twice as much copper uh, in the second compound, twice as many grams of copper in the second compound than there is of chlorine, uh, sorry, chl chlorine in the second compound than there is of chlorine in the first compound. Uh, and it's a small whole number ratio. And we can do this for a lot of substances. Um, and they will have a 2.0 or a 3.0 or sometimes a 1.5 ratio, which is, makes it a 3 to 2 ratio. Um, it gets a little confusing because a lot of people don't like proportions and ratios and stuff like that. Don't worry too much about it. Uh, like I said, when we start putting chemical formulas together, we're going to see this, but we're going to kind of do it in a simpler way. All right, so uh, it's going to kind of be much e a little bit easier when we go ahead and start putting together uh, the chemical formulas later on. Okay, so um, that's all I'm going to cover for uh, you know, this chapter. And like I said, uh, I'm not having you do a lot of problems on uh, definite law of definite proportions, law of multiple proportions. I just want you to know that they're there, and they are the basis for putting together chemical formulas. But um, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time. We, we've got a whole bunch of other calculations what, that we need to uh, learn how to do. And they probably have much more to do with what we're going to be doing down the line. Okay, so um, that's all for this one. Hope it was helpful.